Slightly later than scheduled, BBC Two now begins a weekend of celebrations for the first landing on Mars for over two decades. And to launch the event is Clive Anderson. And welcome to a weekend on Mars, three evenings of television inspired by the lonely journey of a tiny automaton to a hostile alien world. And I don't mean William Haig's trip to Scotland to search for surviving conservatives. <laughs> They're there somewhere, William. I think they may have moved in with the Loch Ness Monster, though. <laughs> now, we're here to tell you about uh, Pathfinder, the NASA spacecraft which landed on Mars earlier this evening, July the 4th, Independence Day. Yeah. Uncanny, isn't it? There you go. That's uh, NASA, if you can see that, uh, celebrating. After a journey of uh, seven months covering 310 million miles, Pathfinder arrived on Mars just over two hours ago. And the scenes there were the scenes at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory when Mission Control got the message at three minutes past six that uh, Pathfinder had finally landed on time to the minutes. And that's, uh, that's Flight Commander Rob Manning with, with the beard. Oh, I say that's him there. He's disappeared away. He's overcome with excitement. Anyway, uh, seven months of waiting are uh, over. Well, not quite, because uh, Pathfinder has reached the surface of Mars, we know that, but as space probes go, this is a very fragile little thing, and we still don't know what state it's in. Uh, Pathfinder landed during the Martian night, and we won't know whether it survived the landing unscathed until sunrise on Mars, which will be in about an hour, as I'm sure you know. Over the last two hours since touchdown, the airbags that cushioned the impact with the surface will have deflated, uh, the probe will work out which end is up and it will flip itself over and the metal petals uh, which hold the rover inside will have opened up and the probe will be cooling down after the scorching entry through the Martian atmosphere. Then at around about 9.30 at night the sun will rise over the horizon and the solar panels will start to generate power. Uh, at that point, at a few minutes to 10, Pathfinder will send back to Earth the first information from the surface of Mars in over 20 years. The information will take around 10 minutes to reach NASA and put Rob Manning and his team out of their misery. And us come to that. Uh, Pathfinder might, though, be lying in bits. And until we get that first signal, we just don't know. And that leads me to the first of our studio guests this evening, a man who's been through more of these nail-biting moments than uh, I, or indeed anybody else has, uh, Dr. Patrick Moore. <laughs> Also uh, with me is the self-confessed rock fetishist, the British geologist at the centre of the debate about life on Mars, Dr. Monica Grady. <laughs> and, and last but not least, a man who knows all about Martians, uh, at any rate as they appear to the imagination of mankind, co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, Mr. John Clute. <laughs> so, so um, Patrick, um, Another space mission, another landing this time on Mars. Do they yes. still create the same excitement for you? I think more so, really, because this is something entirely new, at the start of an entirely new phase in our exploration of Mars. We're not all, the Vikings that landed there in the 1970s, they came down and stayed put. And yeah. the rover of Pathfinder should move around. All right, and that makes it exciting for you. It does of, indeed. A bit of moving around. It does um, indeed. Monica, now, if, if things go to plan, there'll be, at any rate, pictures of uh, rocks on Mars. Does that, will that get, is this what excites a geologist, or is it just the same oh, as seeing yes. stones in your garden? No, 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 no. Rocks on Mars are very, very different. We, we only know a little bit of what, about what rocks on Mars are like. The Viking yeah. only looked at the soil. This is the first probe that's going to look at, at rocks themselves. So very exciting indeed. Right. Now, from the science pic uh, fiction point of view, uh, the, uh, well, what we really want to see in science fiction is, uh, is ferocious, bug-eyed monsters uh, determined on world domination. Um, but we're not likely to see Mike Tyson on Mars, are we? <laughs> I think it's pretty unlikely. Okay. Um, there are thousands of stories about Mars. Most of them are very old, and almost all of them are untrue. We're now uh, beginning... Okay, I've got to cut you off, because now Pathfinder isn't the first man-made object to make it to the surface of Mars. The Americans and the Soviets have been sending unmanned probes to Mars for over 30 years, but very few of them have been successful. 
uh, remarkably few. In fact, it's a bit of a Bermuda Triangle of uh, space exploration uh, compared to other destinations. So watch now a special edition of Horizon Destination Mars, which chronicles the Martian touchdowns and cock-ups of the past and looks forward to a more successful future on the Red Planet. We'll be back at 40 minutes past nine to bring you all the drama, live as it happens, all the way from Mars via Los Angeles, straight to your living room. See you, man or Martian, after that. This is BBC Two's Mars Weekend, and we'll be joining Clive Anderson in a couple of minutes after a look at the Martian weather forecast with Ian McCaskill. Hello, good evening. As if it wasn't hard enough forecasting for Earth, the Martian weather systems are even more chaotic and unpredictable than our own. Mars is much smaller than the Earth, and its gravity only one-third as strong. This is not all good news. Throw away your Zimmer frame, because even the lightest of winds can disturb the powdery red surface and cause dust devils or sometimes Mars-wide dust storms turning the blue sky pink. The weather on Mars, like on Earth, can be very changeable. There are weather fronts there too, but in addition, Mars orbit is more elliptical than our own, taking it much farther away from the sun for a time during its 687 day long year. Another cause of climatic chaos is the atmosphere itself, comprising of carbon dioxide and just a little water vapor. The carbon dioxide can and does change quickly between solid and gas, causing pronounced pressure changes and thus wind but no rain. It hasn't rained for a very long time in Mars, several hundred million years of hosepipe ban, in fact. The atmosphere is now far too thin and cold, with what little water vapor there is trapped in ice crystal clouds and frost. You can see the ice caps are here uh, and here, uh, mostly made up of frozen carbon dioxide, or dry ice, as we call it on Earth. Dust storms are the big thing, though. You can see the dust sweeping across the plain, and the sun's heat on the clouds of dust can give the storms an added boost and the life of their very own. Of course, what we're really interested in is the weather at the landing site of NASA's Pathfinder spacecraft. The site, known today as Aris Vallis, is on an ancient floodplain. The weather conditions for this area of Mars are usually fairly quiet at this time of year, with temperatures between minus 80 and minus 100 degrees Celsius. At the moment, there's a dust storm churning through the deep canyons of the Vallis Marineris Canyon system, 1,800 miles long and 600 miles south of the landing area. This is a shot of the surface on a fine Martian day. At the site itself, uh, there are there's a lot of thin, wispy ice crystal cloud at the moment, just like our own cirrus clouds, and this will hopefully keep the surface temperature down and also keep the dust down in the canyons. So a good bet for the weekend that Aris Vallis is very cold and cloudy, but very, very dry. Wind speeds uh, typically 10 miles an hour with gusts to 60 miles an hour. So a chance of some interesting weather then and look out for those dust devils. That's all for me. I wish you a very good night. Bye bye for now. And as part of our Mars weekend now on BBC Two, we join Clive Anderson live on Earth. exciting and excited studio as we await a signal from Mars to tell us that all is well and that the NASA probe Pathfinder has suffered no fatal injuries after one of the most unusual touchdowns in history. It will take a British Lions try in South Africa. <laughs> Pathfinder is now on Mars, we know that, but until seven minutes past ten tonight we really won't know whether it's in bits or in good shape and raring to go. Anyway, to discuss the mission until then I'm joined by three very distinguished guests. The first well, no evening like this will be complete without the man who more or less invented space as we know it, Patrick Moore. 
Then, then from the Natural History Museum, a geologist who has been at the heart of the debate about life on Mars, a woman into every kind of rock from iron pyrites to Led Zeppelin, Monica Grady. And finally, a man who knows more about Martians than Martians do themselves, since they probably don't exist, the co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, John Clute. Uh, for those of you who have just joined us, you're late, but let's take a look at the events that have happened earlier today. And uh, these were the uh, tent scenes the at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena earlier this evening, There's just before Pathfinder landed. During the landing, Pathfinder sent back a signal which lasted a few minutes after touchdown. The purpose of this was simply to tell Mission Control that Pathfinder hadn't been uh, destroyed during the dangerous entry and landing procedures. Uh, what it hasn't told us is whether everything has arrived in working order and ready for a fortnight or so of running around the surface of Mars, taking photos, sending messages home and generally acting like a tourist. There you go, though. As you can see, Mission Control at JPL were extremely relieved at around 6 o'clock this evening to receive that first signal telling them that so far everything was going well. Now, in the three hours since then, the airbags surrounding Pathfinder have deflated and the petals, so-called, surrounding the little rover have opened up and allowed the probe to cool down while it waits for dawn to break on Mars. Oh, they've even got pictures of dawn breaking on Mars, what it might look like. Now, the Mars landing site is roughly on Bangkok time for some reason at the moment, and so the sun should be rising any time now. Once the sun's rays hit Pathfinder's solar panels, it will wake up, give itself a quick health check, make sure it hasn't got any broken limbs or short circuits, and then it'll be, uh, send the really important signal, the detailed report that Pathfinder is fit and well and ready for its first full day's work on Mars. Either that or it'll phone in sick. Now, we're expecting its message at seven minutes past ten, uh, but as you will have seen in the Horizon documentary earlier, unless you switched over to Channel 5, stranger things have happened, this isn't the first time we've landed probes on Mars. I say we, somebody's landed probes on Mars. There were two hugely successful probes in 1976. The Viking landers gave the first ever images from the surface of Mars, as we can see from these pictures. But apart from the panorama, Viking also ran tests on the Martian soil, and that was some 21 uh, years ago. So, Patrick, uh, now we've got this mission, 21 years on, how is this different? Is this any, any further forward? Oh, very much so. After all, remember, the Vikings simply came down and there they stayed. Yes. And now this, uh, the rover from the Pathfinder should must move around. Yes. I'm sure that over at the JPL at the moment, the atmosphere is almost unbelievably tense. So there's a good I mean, atmosphere there, 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 there if there's not the, much of... Some of these things work, some that are manners, one, three and eight, they don't yes. work. It is very tense. Yeah. And, of course, an immense amount of testing has gone on. And yeah. looking at those, some of the records of that testing is quite amazing. But nonetheless, this is quite a cheap mission, really. It's only cost $150, $200 million, which is... Yeah. And you'd spend that getting to something which might or might not be Van Gogh. How about a quarter of a, of, of a nuclear submarine? Yes. So, like that. so yeah. now, but what are we going to find from the geological point of view, Monica? What's uh, just by looking at it? Are you going to tell very much about the? The rocks that are there? Well, we hope so. The site has been chosen very carefully to be at the mouth of a river valley where there should be a, a range of rock types from the highlands. There might be volcanic rocks, there might be vo rocks from just below the surface, there might be sedimentary rocks showing sort of yeah. stripes as if they'd been laid down in the river. So Even fossils, if there happen to be any. But, uh, Maybe. They're talking this down. That, <laughs> that's what we want to see some fossils. You know, uh, fr probably not. From a not. science fiction point of view, this is all far less small beer, isn't it? Now, because this. Uh, rover. We've, the best we can do to illustrate what it's like, it's it's a bit bigger than that. Uh, not much lot. bigger in size, and it's a lot it's a lot heavier. But it's not much bigger yeah. than that, is it? Not a lot, no. Not, uh, much. not the size of a large television set. Yeah. So this is what's wrong. Now we've seen Star Trek and Star Wars. Even Doctor Who had better props than this <laughs> uh, normally. So is this good, is this a bit disappointing? From the size if it of is, world? I would be personally disappointed in the person who was disappointed. Yes. Because what we have here is not a story, not a prop, yeah. but for the first time, a vehicle which moves on Mars. Yeah. And we have it significantly very, very cheap. In a sense, it doesn't matter nearly as much if this one fails. No. Because it only costs under $50 million. All oh, right, so we just order a, a new one. And other others on the, in the pipeline. But pipe this is going to wander around. And it's, but it's, it's only destined to last about a week or, or, or two weeks. Now, that's a short time, even for a rover in the British Leyland days. So <laughs> couldn't, couldn't it last a bit longer than that? To get well, more it almost certainly could, I think. But on the other hand, don't forget, if it's going to succeed, it'll do so pretty quickly. Yeah. And the, uh, the most important information will come back pretty well straight away. Yes. So what's going to happen, though, after a week or two? Why is it going to stop? It'll run out of power. 
Yeah. And after all, it'll simply stay there until someday someone's going to go up there, find it, and cut mm. into it to a Martian museum. But it's, sure got, it, it's got solar panels to power it. Oh, yes. Or, and, or, or have they just not fitted batteries? The way no, it's 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 sh it things. should be powered up for some time. Yeah. And these experiments very often last longer than yeah. intended to do. But so if it it's got solar power, time. why can't it go on forever? What's, what's uh, simply, well, the, the, the Martian night is very, very cold, minus yeah. more than minus 200 degrees, and yeah. it can't survive that for very long. So it'll freeze its solar panels off. Yes. <laughs> All right, and and it's, it doesn't go very fast, does it? It goes no, about um, twenty meters per hour. I think it is something very very slow indeed. Yeah, uh, so that means it's not going to cover a huge no. amount of ground. It won't. It won't cover very uh, wide area because it can't go very far away from its um, for landing point. Mm. Otherwise, contact will be lost. It's a very restricted thing. But the yeah. point is, it will move around, and it will show that this can be done. Yes, this after all is yeah. a very much of a pioneering mission. Yeah. And we're going to see in a moment how this is done, but uh, is this going to be enough to, to be able to find en enough different rocks to make a meaningful inquiry from yeah. your point of view? Oh, yes, should be able to, because as well as having the solar panels on it, it's got a little sensor which will move up and, yeah. and actually move against a, a rock face and take a, a, a composition, me me measure the chemistry of the rock. And so yes. it'll go say, right, OK, that one's a green one, move on to that one, that one's a red one, right. that one's a blue one. OK, we're going to hear a bit more about that, uh, because the rover is clearly the key to making this mission uh, different from the others. And the first picture of the rover on the surface of Mars won't be sent back until early tomorrow morning. And you'll have your first opportunity to see them on open Saturday with, well, with Patrick Moore <laughs> at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. So he's going to have to dash off and get a good night's sleep after this programme. In the meantime, just how do you control a vehicle when it's 130 million miles away? We have now the first of our home videos from Mission Control bringing insights into the day-to-day -day problems of landings and operating a probe on Mars. Now, this is to be done by Brian Cooper. So perhaps it'll be called, a, not a rover, but a Mini Cooper. He's the man who's actually going to be driving the rover, and it kicks off with a driving lesson on Mars. Hi, my name is Brian Cooper, and I'm the rover driver for Mars Pathfinder. Today, I'm going to show you how we're going to tell the rover where to go on the surface of Mars. Take a look over here, and we have a, an, a, a screen, and I have six images from the lander cameras. And what I'm going to do is move this icon of the rover and uh, most of you have had a, a good experience maybe playing with a radio control uh, toy car and you think that's how we probably want to tell the rover how to go but it doesn't work that way the problem is it takes ten and a half minutes for the, the signal to get from earth to mars so say if this if i were to tell the rover where to go with my joystick here and uh... if i if i give it a command to go to a certain location like say out here uh, by the time I, I, that signal gets to Mars, it's going to be ten and a half minutes later. Similarly, if I get pictures coming back down from Mars, they're going to be ten and a half minutes old. So it won't work. What we need to do is make the rover smart and smart enough to go where I tell it to go, but do it safely so in case I make a mistake and, and accidentally tell it to go over a cliff, it won't do it. See the rover here? I can move that off the pedal onto the surface. And if we like where it is, we can click a button and leave an icon for a waypoint. This is where we want the rover to go. And it's a nice clear spot over here. Let's tell it to go over here. And let's say we want to go to this pile of rocks on the right. And uh, this, would be the, this would be where we want to go. At this point, we would uh, tell the rover to spin around and uh, take pictures of the rock that we have that's behind it, and then spin around and uh, place its uh, sensor on it and figure out what the rock is made out of. The rover itself has a sensor that can tell if it's tipping too much and if it senses that it knows it maybe it shouldn't go any further in that direction. It'll go around the obstacle and still try to get to the goal. Uh, what we did, we took images from the lander and we processed them and we're able to put on these special goggles. I'll put them on right now and if I do that I get this extra sense of depth and I can see into the screen uh, in 3D. And now I can get up real close to one of these rocks and see what the shape is or look at it from an overhead view. So let me do that. I want to look at this rock a little closer. We'll zoom it in. And uh, we can see that it's got an interesting shape. And maybe because of the shape that we can only tell in this viewpoint, um, maybe we'll want to go there. Eventually, we can get so far away from the lander, if we want to, that we can't even see the lander anymore. The lander can't see us. When we do that, then we'll be navigating from the viewpoint of just the rover cameras, which is a lot lower, so it'd be like somebody crawling along the ground, and it's going to be, everything's going to look more like a maze. And the last time they did a test, they tried to pull a trick on me and see if I'd noticed, but they put a potted plant 
on a rock. And uh, we don't expect to see a potted plant on Mars, but that'd be pretty neat if we did. Uh, during our testing, though, it was there just kind of uh, as a fun thing that they did to trick me. Well, I think I understood that, but uh, why doesn't my mobile phone work 90% of the time if it's, uh, you know, just trying to communicate with a transmitter just down the road? Anyway, but whereabouts on Mars is, oh, has this rover landed? Uh, the real question is that nobody knows exactly. The landing area has been carefully chosen, but the exact spot remains a mystery until we get some information back later on tonight. In fact, Pathfinder could have landed anywhere in an area that's supposed to be roughly the size of Cornwall. Um, now, that sounds a little bit casual. You know, when, when we're bombing people in the Gulf War, we knew just exactly where Saddam Hussein was having his barbecue. Yes, but the Gulf's a bit closer than Mars. I mean, yes. you're dealing with a distance of more than yeah. 120 million miles. Yeah. So I think it's, it's not bad, you know. No, and I suppose it doesn't really matter, does it, if you just want to hit Mars? Uh, one well, not really. They come down in this general area of Aries Valleys, which is an yes. old floodplain, almost certainly. Yes. And, of course, we haven't got detail of the actual isolated rocks there. No. So really, it's a certain amount of potluck. Well, I've got a, some pictures here, which I hope to demonstrate something. Uh, that should that is a picture of uh, Mars as you can tell and um, and, and there the, there's a problem with a m possible storm um, uh, de developing sorry I'm being getting last minute instructions coming in from Mars there now I'm not sure these pictures do show very clearly with a storm but there is a picture this is the Aries Valley which is landing on and the landing site is somewhere up there and there's a storm uh, building up there now we, we learned about the Viking mission that that uh, rather muck them up. Well, in point of fact, the, story, the dust storm is not there. It's uh, somewhere away in the, near the valleys of Madineris. Yeah. And, of course, although the wind speeds may be high, the Martian atmosphere is extremely thin. Yes. Don't forget, it's mainly carbon dioxide, and the ground pressure is below 10 millibars yeah. everywhere. So I think there's no danger at all if it will be toppled over. The yeah. danger, of course, comes from dust being deposited on yeah. the various equipment. And it could and engulf our little yes. uh, rover so, thing. Yes, but does. you've actually got us some rock from Mars already, haven't you? That's right, I've yes. got it there. I mean, yep. very very careful with it. Now, how did you get that? How did we have that bit? Well, that didn't cost us any uh, number of millions of dollars at all. This one came for free. It's a meteorite, and uh, it was blasted off the surface of Mars by an asteroid that came down, thumped yeah. into Mars, and shot the rock off. And this uh, particular piece of rock uh, fell in the village of El Nakla al Bahariya near Alexandria in Egypt in 1911. And what happened to it when it landed? Uh, it allegedly killed a dog, yes. one of the shower of stones. So it's a very, very <laughs> special thing. That we I bet somebody was looking after the dog at the time. <laughs> uh, because the dog's pets always die when somebody <laughs> else is looking after them. So, oh, well, there was this dog, uh, and I had it out, and um, uh, a meteorite uh, uh, killed uh, it. Rock came from space so that's a lot cheaper than, a lot cheaper than, um, than, uh, than having to send something there yourself, if they're just going to shower rocks down on us. That's, 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 that's right, but we can't rely on it. We can't predict yeah. when and where they're going to fall. We can't predict that they're coming from Mars, because most of them come and from And can the you be certain though. that actually did come from Mars and not just from a tower block down the road? I can, be certain this, I can be certain this came from Mars because gases trapped in ro rocks like this contain samples of the Martian atmosphere. As Patrick said, the Martian atmosphere is mainly carbon dioxide. It's very different from Earth's atmosphere. So by melting bits of this rock and taking the atmosphere out, we can see that it's definitely come from Mars. Oh, well, we'll come back to that. But uh, now one of the reasons that NASA chose the Ares Valley for the landing site was because it had reasonably good weather. And I've uh, demonstrated the photographs to you already, uh, such as we could see. Mars, as we saw early on in the evening, can be prone to violent winds and dust storms and recent images from the Hubble Space Telescope however, have been a cause for concern. And the latest images do suggest that there is a sandstorm around and it started blowing less than 600 miles south of the landing site in the Valles uh, Marineris, which I think you pronounced rather better than I did, uh, <laughs> Patrick, uh, canyon. Now that's a canyon that would run from um, New York to Los Angeles and it's six miles deep, so quite a grand canyon in itself. And it was a similar dust storm, of course, which preceded the major sandstorm of 1976, which covered the entire surface of Mars just as the Viking probes had arrived. On the other hand, the same images show that there are thick clouds looming just to the north of the landing site, and this hope that these will keep the temperature down and reduce the risk of a major sandstorm. Nevertheless, with uh, wind speeds of uh, 80 miles an hour, sandstorm would be pretty damaging to the fragile rover. I mean, you seem to say, well, it wouldn't be too bad. But well, uh, I don't think it will. See, the atmosphere is so thin. Now, after all, you know, the winds are going to be only 100th the strength of, uh, of Earth winds at the mm. same time. Now, I think the main danger there is that the, the dust may mm. actually cover the vital parts and possibly cut off the solar yeah. panels. I don't think it will. Just a, this is not really a major dust storm anyway. There's some way away. Yeah. I must say, from my observatory, I looked at Mars a couple of nights ago, and I would have seen anything with a major thing to be there, and I didn't. You'd have told them and said... Uh, Certainly. They could have a blower on the front of it, just to blow Why some not? of the dust away, just to keep it a bit clear. 
All right. Um, now, so we know something about the landing sites. Just now remind ourselves of what Pathfinder went through in order to get there. Uh, in the second of our home videos from Mission Control at NASA, Flight Commander Rob Manning explains the perilous landing sequence that Pathfinder underwent uh, just a couple of hours ago. Where I am right now, this is actually a, a, an area where we actually test Mars rovers and landers. This is called the Mars Yard. And the nice thing about this place is that it's built exactly to represent what we think Mars looked like at the Viking 1 and Viking 2 landing sites from 20 years past. So this is what we think Mars Pathfinder is going to see when it gets there. The drama of landing, unfortunately, cannot be seen by any of us. First of all, it's nighttime, but secondly, there's no one there to see it. A few hours ago, the space capsule hits the upper atmosphere of Mars at 7.2 kilometers per second, incredibly high speeds, in a long trail of flame as, it, as the heat shield absorbs the energy of that, of that deceleration. Shortly after that, a parachute opens up. The parachute does a great job getting us down to about 120 miles an hour. Uh, that's the best they can do, and our airbags that protect the lander when it hits the ground for the first time cannot handle those kinds of speeds, so we have to stop this whole system mid-air, some 45 feet above the ground, with these solid rocket motors, which are lit at the very last instance, just before it hits the ground. So Mars will get this bright, blinding flash of light, uh, lighting up the scene, and from there, these giant 17-foot diameter bags hits the ground, and it will sail. It will go for least 100 meters per bounce hitting this area and bouncing sailing clear over to that building way over there it's gonna stay in one piece oh yes <laughs> right Right, now I mentioned in the introduction, uh, Patrick, that you invented uh, space, but of course that's a little bit of an exaggeration. We all know that Galileo invented space, uh, but you have been around a long time and you made a name for yourself in astronomy before space flight was possible. In fact, you did your first TV the same year that Sputnik was launched, and uh, I was, sorry, it's sounding like this is your life, but did you ever expect you'd get to the day when you would see, or we'd be able to see, little creatures, or at least little rovers, uh, wandering um, around on Mars? I thought I would. On the other hand, my time scale was wrong. At that stage, I was, I was expecting the first man on the moon by about 1980, yeah. because it was 1969. Yeah. My time scale was definitely too pessimistic. I knew what happened, but yes. whether I would see it myself, I didn't know. I yeah. only hoped so. So this is going better than, than, than you thought? Uh, it's going so, certainly much yeah. faster than I thought All it right. would, yes. Well, we've got five minutes, uh, something like five minutes, just over five minutes, to when the point should come when we yes. get the signal to say it's all all right. If it doesn't come, all is not necessarily lost. No. Uh, makes a rather drab moment in this program, but uh, <laughs> there are, there, they could possibly give a signal later with... Uh, the high gain antenna, which will open just after one o'clock this morning. Yes, and they can't switch those on immediately. No, they can't. Well, well, why is that? Do they need more power for that? Yes. Or? Right. Okay, well, <laughs> I guessed right. Well, uh, just to show the problems that uh, planet and stargazers had from Galileo's time right up to the space age, here's a vintage clip from uh, the sky at night <laughs> in the very early days, featuring uh, a familiar face. Wasn't meant to be a comedy show, it turned out that way. Well, of course, when we come to this kind of thing, we are rather dependent upon the weather. In fact, we're entirely so, because if you have clouds, there's really very little you can do about it. God, what do you think oh. of the prospects now at the moment? I think we're nearly totally obscured, Patrick. Do you think it's any good turning on to the direct general direction of the moon? Frankly, I don't think it is. I can't no. see a single star at the moment. It's totally obscured. We were hoping to see Vega, which is the star, bright star, straight above our heads, but even that's gone now. No, we've got to abandon it for a moment. We're until. blacked out. What? If we can see one star, we'll just get the telescope onto it and give you at least a direct picture of that. No, we Isn't are good? totally obscured. Well, <laughs> there's hope yet. We still have some uh, minutes. Except I can see old here. Can you? But it's gone again. <coughs> it's, it goes before you can get near it. Well, Altair seems to be about the best bet. I suggest you turn the telescope onto Altair, and just as soon as we get any kind of a picture at all, we can, we can feed it through, so to speak. Any luck? 
No, I must be able to see it before I can get on to it. <laughs> of course. This, of course, is one of the hazards of astronomy. There's not just nothing one can do about it at all. There is definitely a lightning over there now, George. Can you see it? It's coming out. Yes, there is the moon. I can see it for the moment. No, it's gone again. It's gone. <laughs> no, no, no. Infuriating. There's nothing one can do. George, can you see anything at all? Vega! Can you I see Vega? I don't know whether I can get on it. Right, the star Vega, which is the thing that you wanted to show you. It's a bright blue star right above us, as I said earlier on. And with any luck now, we will be able to get the telescope on it. I can see it quite clearly, and I think we're just, gonna, just, just about going to have time to show it to you. But, of course, there's still a lot of drifting cloud up there, and we just can't tell whether it's going to be obscured at the critical moment. Um, of course, you won't see Vega looking large, because no telescope yet built will show a star. It's gone, the point of light. Is it gone? <laughs> just as I got it on the crosswires, it blacked right out. How absolutely typical. There's nothing we can do about it. I can't move a 24-inch telescope quicker than that. No, I'm afraid you can't. So, from Brighton, where the sky, sky is now completely overcast, good night. Good night. <laughs> I, uh, 1957. I, I recognise the familiar sound of somebody filling in as you're desperately waiting for something to happen. Frantic but, padding. But, but everything else has changed apart from your suit, which I notice is exactly the same. <laughs> the same one, probably. I may say, both five minutes before and five minutes after that 20-minute live programme, the sky was brilliantly clear. Right. Jolly good. Well, we're, we're, we think, two minutes away from uh, getting some sort of signal yes. that uh, the, uh, the thing has landed and is now signalling uh, to us. Uh, but, Monica, you just tell us where this little rover is sitting there waiting. Is, is this, has this spot been selected simply because it's the least dangerous place to, to bounce to a halt or because of the, the attraction of the no, rock site? Because of the attraction of the rock site. It's in a place called the Aries Vallis, which is flat layer, uh, flat area, about, oh, I don't know, 200 by 100 kilometres, I think think it said yeah. and it's at the mouth of a river channel it's flat it's showing a lot of different variations in rock types will be there yeah. um, it's believed that the pathfinder has actually landed on a raised island in part of that valley right. where there should be a fair amount of different types of rock um, well, you say it's a river valley, but the river would have flown there, what, millions of years oh, ago? Oh, absolutely, yeah. millions of years ago. Yeah. I mean, there's no trace of water there now. No. And not, not so much a river valley, more a delta, more a sort of catastrophic outflowing where rocks would have been swept down from the highlands. And that's another reason why it was chosen, because it's sampling highland area, whereas Viking did not sample highland rocks. Right. So this is what we're hoping. We're going to get a different type of rock from the rocks or from the soil that Viking sampled. Yeah. And what we'll be able to tell about it from just this little thing going up and looking at it is it's, fo it's obviously getting 3D pictures, but will you be able to say, oh, that's the sort of rock that we have on Earth or it's something completely unusual? Yes, I mean, this rock that I have here is, is a basalt. It's formed in the roots of a volcano. We're hoping perhaps that the type of rocks that Pathfinder or that Sojourner is going to look at will have a composition similar to that. They're rocks that have been brought up from, the, from a volcano and yeah. cascaded down and then weathered by water and then rushed yeah. down this channel. Right. Also, there might be sedimentary rocks, rocks laid down in water, which have been brought down by the same stream and, and right. jumbled together. With okay, we're going to. Uh, sorry to stop you there. We've got to zoom over to Pasadena because yes. there's a jolly sound to it, and we should see some pictures of the uh, the crew uh, waiting to get this signal. 12, 11 seconds to go. Looks like the front office of a sort of accountancy firm, but uh, they'll get excited. That is Bob Manning. Yeah. Yes, he's the guy in the beard, as, the, as we saw earlier on. He's the uh, control the whole thing. Oh, he's he's gone off, maybe a bit nervous, has to pop out for a moment. Oh, now this should be the time then. This is the we're, great we're waiting for them to whoop up. Come. We have the closed loop receivers in lock and carrier. Oh, that looks... Yeah, that's it, we have the signal. <laughs> it's a very scientific way to work these things <laughs> out. <laughs> the expected this, power is within one decimal. This is why we, this couldn't be a British mission, because the British will just go, oh, well, that's it then, that's fine. But <laughs> <laughs> at least sort of go, oh. Okay, actual data from the Okay, are we happy with that? While well, they celebrate in a controlly wild way. So, um, so this is a, is a great relief for everybody, uh, uh, Patrick. Uh, it looks yeah. like it. I mean, yeah. don't, uh, don't be too cocksure yet. I mean, we uh, no, don't I'm, quite I'm know whether we're getting any pictures back. I'm never cocksure, if at all possible. It looks good. <laughs> yes. Um, well, um, well, what can they do if, if, if it turns out not to be right? They'd have me sort of start putting thumbs down or something like that. Um, so what are they, what are they going to be looking for next? We've got the signal to say it's, it's ready. Um, We've got the signal to say the petals have opened, it's being able to point its antenna at the sun, it's being able to direct itself. They're now going to um, decide 
whether yeah. the low gain antenna has unfolded, whether that's all yeah. right, they'll decide whether to deploy the high gain antenna and they'll make decisions um, in an hour or so's time, whether the ramps should come down, whether the sojourner yeah. will go out and th the first pictures will be coming back in an hour or two's time. Yeah. So this just means at the moment that the petals have folded back and that the mast has gone up. Yeah. So you, you've been in a lot of these, uh, these mission points when there's a lot of tension building up to whether it's going to happen or not. Um, I mean, does, does every sort of job on the line as to whether it's going to work, or would they have just done another one? No, they, they were, after all, you say, this, um, by space standards, this, is, uh, this has cost a lot less than some of the earlier ones. And as yeah. you say, if it doesn't work, it is, it is a pioneering mission. And I think yeah. already, although we know it's landed there, and this very complicated manoeuvre, we know it's landed, we know the petals have unfurled, so even if nothing more happens now, and yes. I think it will, but even if nothing more happens, you still can't uh, write this off as a total failure, even so. No, no. I think it may be a total success. Yes. But already, we can say that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's proved its worth. Yes. And, uh, I mean, do, do you think this is now fitting in with, uh, you know, H.G. Wells would be pleased to see that we've uh, got as far as uh, Mars? <coughs> He'd be enormously pleased. He'd be enormously pleased at the fact that we're no longer telling big stories about Mars. We're beginning to tell little stories that work. Yeah. It's terribly, terribly important yeah. that these that these yeah. missions continue, yeah. not that the whole thing depends on success or failure of one enormously expensive obsolete mission. Yes. So this represents a sort of revival of the whole space program compared to, there's sort of been a few hiccups, haven't there, the last uh, decade or so? Well, Absolute revival. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. This is called Pathfinder. Yes. I mean, it is a Pathfinder. It's providing yeah. information for other missions that are being yeah. planned. Yes. It's providing information about the surface of Mars for the surveyor mission which is coming. All right, well, let's go on to the future because over the next uh, week or two, the rover will wander around as much of the surface of Mars as it can manage, photographing rocks, poking around in crevices, and doing some simple analysis. And this should tell us something about the geology of Mars and arguably about the history of Earth. Uh, this is fantastically exciting for geologists and astronomers, but it's unlikely to answer the question that the rest of us are perhaps more interested in. Is there or has there ever been life on a planet other than Earth? Now, last year, NASA announced the possibility that there were signs of life in a meteorite that had come from Mars, which uh, has the snappy title of ALH84001. Now, one of the experts who examined the meteorite uh, was Monica Grady here. So, uh, do you think there is evidence in the, it's not this meteorite here, but an yeah. another one. Is, is, was there evidence found in that to show that there was life on Mars? Sadly, no. Uh, well, the well, jury... Some people seem to think, because yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right. there might be tiny bacteria. <laughs> all right, the jury's still out, but most, most scientists believe that the structures that were described by the scientists from NASA are simply uh, crystallographic features that they interpreted mm. as biological, where they were totally inorganic. Yeah. What the rock did show however was that there were salts that there were crystals inside that rock that had been laid down in water at a reasonable temperature for life to have existed so the environmental conditions were right on Mars and that's what that rock showed it showed that life could have survived. So little wormy shapes were not worms they were just uh, crystalline structures. That's, that's what I believe and that's what many scientists believe. Yeah well it's 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 exciting I mean it's I think it's fantastic exciting getting to Mars but in a strange way, uh, space isn't, the planets aren't turning out to be quite as exciting as we thought they were going to be. We're not finding uh, no. creatures or even slime molds or, or anything there or just, just something. So does, do you find this a bit disappointing as we actually make the landing? No, I don't really. I might if I was, say, 17 or 18. But um, and you must as be at least five years. Oh, I'm at least five years older than yes. that. And, yeah. um, and I find that the stories about Mars or about mm. the solar system or about the galaxy are great fun to read. Yeah. But we know they're stories. We know they're, we know they're not true. Most of well, them we are pretty know, old. Well, we know that now, but somebody writing a story 100 years ago could imagine there to be life yeah. on Mars, yeah. and, and it was at least plausible. It was possible. There might have been vegetation. There were patterns. Wells. Somebody even thought there might be canals there, or at least a, a, a term. Wells made, Wells made use of this Percival Lowell's mm -hmm. invention of the canals on yeah. Mars by mistranslating Schiaparelli's Channels. He, he described Canelli in Italian, yeah. and that was and he, translated that was good as canals. For canals and, and we good imagined the Irishman there digging yeah. it for. So, and in terms of 100 years ago, yeah. it was a perfectly good hypothetical idea. Yeah. But we well, know now. We know, we know now the story is just as good as it ever was, but we know it's not based on a real Mars. And there could be life on any number of planets, which might be anywhere in the universe, but they're all billions of miles away that you can't get to. The terribly thrilling thing about the trailing of this possible life last year was that if it turned out to have been true it was probably the most important story we could have ever heard yeah. because if two 
if two planets in one solar system independently generated life, that would have meant that there were, of yeah. course, trillions of planets in the universe that had generated life, almost, yeah. almost certainly. So what we really want is somebody to pick up something, to pick up this rover and shake it around a bit, <laughs> and then we think, ah, oh, now we have a story. <laughs> we, would, we would have the story. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure we would like that story, because that story would be a science fiction story, yeah. and it would be melodramatic, and it would not be particularly um, beneficial to our egos. Okay, all right. Uh, well, we'll find out over the next week or so just how successful Pathfinder will be. Um, but without taking anything away from the rover, I suppose the mission that everyone wants to see uh, is the first astronauts on Mars. Now, according to the uh, documentary Mars, Death or Glory, which is tomorrow night on BBC Two, the round trip for a manned expedition to Mars would take about three years, with no real guarantee that the astronauts would ever come back alive. Surely only a lunatic would consider such a trip. Well, British astronaut Commander Mike Fole is at this very moment circling the Earth on the damaged Mir space station. He's one of NASA's most experienced astronauts, having made four trips in space, including this dramatic spacewalk. Despite his first-hand knowledge of the perils of space, space flight, it remains his dream to be one of the first men to walk on Mars. Just before he left for Mir, he was interviewed for Death or Glory and asked what he felt about the risks associated with travelling millions of miles to another planet. And so when you ask a man who has a young family and a wife, are you willing to do that? He has to really come to terms with this. And I'm not at that point yet. Luckily, I'm not being asked yet. By the time I'm older, maybe my relationship will, with my wife will be such that I could do this. Maybe my wife will be in a position that she could do this with me. Because when you're sending people for such a long period of time to Mars, you're not dealing with just skill mixes, randomly throwing people together and saying, get on. Um, you need to come up with groups that can um, live together as a family, basically. And so maybe it's appropriate to send spouses with, with astronauts. My wife happens to be uh, pretty well qualified in that area anyway. So that's, th that's how the daydream goes. Well, we were hoping to speak to Mike this evening, but unfortunately, as you may have heard, a bit of bad parking on Mir has meant we can't get in contact with him. Um, but do you think that, that that's, a, that's the recent, the most recent of these accidents, do you think this mere accident has uh, put the mockers on manned flight going towards Mars? We're no, all shaking your heads. It's certainly, it's certainly um, a, a hitch, no question yes. about that. But um, it's, a, it's a blip. It's, no, it's, um, it's a major one, obviously. It may delay things a bit, but it certainly won't kill it. Oh, no. But in order to get to Mars uh, as a three-year round trip, you've got to put up with radiation, which might... It causes all sorts of problems, the possibility of crashing, and obviously testing everything to the limit. So Human body could be the weak link, of course, and one thing you can't do is to turn around and come back. Yeah. After all, they had the near disaster with Apollo 13, and they could go around the moon and come back ahead well, of time. Well, that's peanuts going to the moon, mm. so it now exactly. turns out. They're going to Mars. Because Mars is a different matter. Yeah. Well, so would you like to go? Would you volunteer to...? I to would love to go, but you need, need a, a very massive rocket to launch me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're bigger than the <laughs> rover, but... Uh, I'd love to yeah, go, yeah. yeah. I'm a little ancient now, I'm afraid. Yeah. But... Sorry, you, you, are you volunteering as well, or is this just... I, an I would volunteer, certainly, but I was thinking about something else. I was thinking about the mirror, and the mirror is almost, in a sense, the last of a long line of big rockets, a kind of, in a sense, the wrong story of the exploration of space, yes. the story of huge lead time between developing a rocket and sending well, it off so well that it's guaranteed to be obsolete before you send it well, off. Well, you need a big rocket. You can't just have a milk bottle and a sort of uh, I thing don't, you... I don't, I don't know what in 15 or 20 years we're going to need, but I don't think we're going to need these great archaic creatures yes. in space. I think we're, gonna, we're going to have to move in the direction that that the Pathfinder demonstrates. Yes. We're going to have to move towards um, a short lead time so that by the time we send the machine up, it's yes. not already obsolete, yes. so that we can do a variety of things with it. And if it breaks, we can send something else. Mm. The space flight of individuals is terribly important symbolically, but yes. perhaps less important than some of the other um, ventures. And is this little Pathfinder landing, this is part of a more structured uh, plan? Exactly. Uh, the, 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 the trip to the moon was just to prove that we get to the moon. It was Cold War, it was politics, yeah. and this is far more exciting yeah. because it has a future to it. And uh, are, they, are they building on the stuff they had from uh, the Viking missions, or is that kind of... Absolutely. Oh, yes, oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. They're, they're leaping yeah. way ahead yeah. of the Viking yeah. missions. Are you also volunteering to go on uh, one of these trips to, to Mars, or are you happy to have it come back to you? I'd rather stay behind, I think, and analyse the data as it comes back. <laughs> <laughs> So we can, we can uh, sort of not pat ourselves on the back because we've done nothing but sit here and talk about it, but we can pat this mission on, on the back. And they've, they've, they've got the little uh, vehicle there and it'll be showing you pictures tomorrow morning 
Patrick, and uh, anybody who cares to, to, to look in? Well, we can't be sure yet. I say it's too early to be absolutely confident, but I think the outlook is good, and I feel a great deal happier than I did when we went on the air with this program. Well, so do I, but for different reasons. So, uh, <laughs> for those of you who missed it earlier, the news is that uh, NASA's Pathfinder has landed successfully on Mars. After one of the most daring landing procedures ever attempted, Pathfinder dropped to the surface, bounced along for about a mile, before it eventually came to rest at about eight minutes past six this evening. And this was the scene in Mission Control at Jet Propulsion Laboratory when they heard the first signal that told them that so far everything was going to plan. Can't be certain yet. At that point, Pathfinder literally went to sleep, more or less literally, for a few hours to cool down and to wait for sunrise before it sends back a more detailed health check. At seven minutes past ten, JPL started receiving the first detailed information from the Martian surface since the Viking mission in 1976. They expected powers within one decibel. Oh, there it is. That uh, information will tell the scientists at JPL exactly what condition Pathfinder is in. At about one o'clock in the morning, it'll be sending back the first pictures, and they'll show the rover and its petals. And from those pictures, they can work out how best to get the rover down onto the Martian surface. From then on, it'll spend a week or so wandering around Mars, sending, sending back images of Martian rock, Martian dust, but probably not Martian little green men. Well. That's about it from us. Uh, we leave you with uh, Mission Control at JPL in good spirits. Uh, but the Mars weekend doesn't stop here, and we've just got time to tell you about the rest of the programs lined up for the next couple of days. All this information is available on the Mars weekend website, and the address is coming up uh, immediately after this program. Uh, well, immediately after the program, there's uh, What Have the Martians Ever Done for Us, which in the words of BBC's favorite alien is just a bit of fun. Uh, don't forget that if you want to see the first pictures from the surface of Mars beamed back by the Pathfinder, Patrick Moore will be unveiling them on open Saturday, two and a half hours of views and analysis starting at 8 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning on BBC Two. And tomorrow evening, Mars, Death or Glory looks ahead to the first manned mission to Mars, followed swiftly by Fear of a Red Planet about the Martians we love to hate. And moving on to Sunday, and at 5 to 9, there's the no-nonsense Natural History of an Alien, the BBC's Natural History Unit examining the fantastic forms that real aliens might take. And if this whole event has whet your appetite uh, for this mission and all things Martian, don't miss our website at www.bbc.co.uk slash science slash Mars. It's packed with that address and with information about the weekend, the weather, the gossip, the pictures as they happen, and the chat rooms where you can talk to experts about everything from sunsets to life on Mars, quiz a real Martian. Many thanks to my guests this evening, Patrick Moore, Monica Grady, and John Galoot. And before we just go, let's have another look at those shots from NASA's meet Clive Anderson saying, saying good night, good night. For years, third-rate filmmakers have pondered over what creatures might exist in other worlds. Bloodthirsty moon monsters. But now, scientists can speculate on what real aliens would look like. Out there, we're going to find the most fantastic things. Uthers, flying fish that terrorize the skies. Parachuting worms that fall through space. And deadly machine aliens. The Natural History of an Alien, Sunday, 8.55 on BBC Two. Well, because of today's exciting events at Mars, we're unable to bring you space jamming. However, now on BBC Two, we've alien comedy, but not as we know it. their life in the universe? Nobody really knows. But it is possible that in the space beyond us there is life, that there are other suns giving warmth and life.
to worlds like ours. In the years, in the ages, in the eons ahead, we may find the answer to our questions. We may find that in the space beyond us, beyond the stars, there are worlds with life far richer than our own. Greetings. I'm sorry for disturbing your program. All the crazy stuff will be back in a short while. But I must speak with you urgently. My name is Zack. I come from another planet. It is a very different planet to this one. We have no death, no gravity, and a different shaped gear stick on the mini metro. Also, we have a different language. The reason I'm able to speak to you is that this small podule simultaneously translates what you keep it switched on. Two cornets, a 99, and and a chalk ice. I'll never forget the experience. I was driving down this dark country lane and my car came to an abrupt halt. My lights went out and then I saw this huge glowing cigar-shaped object in the air. Then I realised I'd knocked down Jimmy Savile. <laughs> I came here secretly and against the express wishes of the Galactic Council to warn you. To warn you of four courses of action you must take to avoid the imminent destruction of your civilization. Mark them well. Secondly, the Schrecklicke Kartoffelkopf. Anthony Wedgwood Schrebaki. Schrebaki carted off to the funny farm at once. Thirdly, the Barbican Center within five years. And fourthly, beware the one who calls himself Terry Wilgen. He is a Zillon from the planet Tharg and cannot be trusted. Do we have visitors from space? O 1318 calling Mars. O 1318 calling Mars. The so-called human beings cannot yet be observed by direct vision. We therefore apply the close-up viewer with telechannel to home station Mars. Hello there, Dr. Fisher-Price, FBI. Hey, Dr. Ed Bendix of the United States of America Federation for Bureau of Investigation of Medical Safety. Nice to meet you, Ed. Ed what have we got here? What we got here is a cockamamie Martian, a little green man. Little green man, now I'm interested. Oh, Ed, what you gonna call this guy? <laughs> no, he's kinda cute, any. How about E.T., the extra testicle? <laughs> you got a point. <laughs> Damn it, Martin! Martin! Oh, I'm sorry, lads, I've let you down. Yeah, Don't yeah, let yeah, yourself, yeah. Martin! <laughs> All right, well, now I'm gonna ask you five questions apiece and a hundred... $100 a piece, and if you answer them all in 15 seconds, okay? I want you to tell me the first thing that comes into your head. Name a famous explorer. Zythron the Insistent. <laughs> the biggest holiday of the year. The moons of Mitzar. A place you keep your valuables. In a Muldroth ion field. <laughs> a mode of transportation. The foam shoe. <laughs> Something you eat with eggs. Fiberglass. <laughs> What's wrong? It's no good. I know I'm going to die. Why? Tell us why. Princess Diana just visited me. <laughs> When we reach orbital height, I'm turning on main lateral motors, then we'll really slow off with the drone. Listen, you're not proposing to land without any help from the Martians, are you? We haven't gone into orbit. We're going straight down. Right, we're going into land. I'm going to fire retroactive motors again. Full blast. Stand by. Hey. 
What can he see? Nothing. Nothing but a moving mass. Hold it! There's nothing solid down there! It's too late now. We've got to go into there. <laughs> so you reckon we're all going to perish then, eh? Yeah, yeah. Well, you are. I'm not. Because <laughs> I've already written away for my ticket, see, for the rocket. Yeah. I wrote to NASA about it. NASA, he's dead. <laughs> President NASA, you burnt. I'm talking about NASA. Oh. The North American something or another. <laughs> the space capsule itself is, as you can see, designed as a semi-detached in order to provide a natural environment for Mr. and Mrs. Jim Maggots. They are home-loving people, and the design is intended to create a humanized space capsule. Yeah, but will this fragile, semi-detached, stand up to the buffeting in outer space? Ah, no. That is why you have introduced certain aerodynamic refinements. Oh, boy. <laughs> Mind you, I would have thought for space and all that, they would have maybe preferred, they would have picked, you know, like a surgeon or a scientist or something like that. I mean, I wouldn't have thought on Mars there was a great deal of call for, you know, a carpenter. <laughs> what are you trying to say? Well, all I'm trying to say is, you know, they would pick somebody sort of qualified, you know. Well, I'm qualified. I took me city of girls tonight. <laughs> True, but you failed. <laughs> Never land this ship without help from the Martians. Are we going to crash? We shall know in just five seconds. This is it. Stand by. <laughs> Aliens came down with a message for the human race. They called our leaders for a meeting face to face. The thing they wanted to say to all mankind was projected telepathically into a thousand minds. Oh, you're looking at, oh, you're looking at, oh, you're looking at, Earth. oh, you're looking at, oh, you're looking at, oh, you're looking at, oh, you're looking at, oh, you're looking at space. 